take a good look, five and a half inches. How much can you really do with that? Well, what did you think I was talking about? The suspension travel. So with just five and a half inches of suspension travel, is the Honda CB500X really even a true adventure bike? I've spent the last few weeks riding this, Honda's 2021 CB500X, in a variety of different terrains to try to figure out where this bike fits into the adventure marketplace and what kind of rider this bike is for. Are you a beginner rider looking for an easy to ride bike that you can use on your daily commute? Maybe you're a shorter, vertically challenged rider who is sick and tired of the tall seat heights of all the adventure bikes making you stand up on your tippy toes. Or maybe you're just a practical, budget conscious rider looking for something super comfortable, super reliable that you can use in all sorts of conditions and that will never break down. Well, I feel that Honda's CB500X is the answer to all those questions and right now I'm gonna explain why. <laughs> In the USA for 2021, Honda will sell you this, the CB500X with standard ABS for $6,999 US dollars. That puts it well below something like the Yamaha Tenere 700 at 10,000 US dollars, but quite a bit above something like Royal Enfield's Himalayan, which comes in around $5,000 or $5,300 for the new 2022 model. For your $7,000, you get a 471cc parallel twin engine putting out around 50 horsepower and 32 foot-pounds at the crank, a friendly 32.8 inch seat height, 17 and 19 inch cast aluminum wheels with tubeless tires, a 4.6 gallon fuel tank, good for about 300 miles of riding range, 7.1 inches of ground clearance to clear rocks and obstacles on the trail, an LCD dashboard with a lot of useful information, an adjustable windshield, and of course, the legendary reliability that Honda has become known for. Now, unfortunately, I was not able to get the updated 2022 bike for testing. I hope to be able to get that sometime in the next six months. The important differences that they've made to the 2022, they've upgraded the fork. They've gone to an upside down style fork with much improved uh, damping characteristics. They've changed the wheels a little bit, although they're still the same size. They've revised the fuel injection settings. They've given it twin disc brakes, but otherwise it's pretty much the same motorcycle you see here. Let's start our tour here at the front of the Honda CB. So you've got an LED headlight for high and low beam. Uh, you've got this tiny little beak here in the front, which is just a styling element. You've got a low front fender here. You've got the 19 inch tubeless cast aluminum wheel, which we talked about. I really like the design on this wheel. I think it's nice looking. Uh, you've got this telescopic um, front fork, which like I talked about, they're updating for the 2022 bike. It has around five and three quarters inches of travel. Um, which you know I'll talk about in the off-road section, which makes it a little bit hard to control on off-road just because there's not quite enough travel there. Uh, on the 2021 bike, you've got a single front disc. Uh, like I mentioned, the 22 bikes are getting a dual front disc, uh, but I find the brakes to be adequate. They're powerful and it's better than something like a KLR 650. Uh, you've got full LED turn signals, which is a really, really nice touch on front and the back. And then you've got this pretty large windshield with two vents in it to reduce buffeting. Um, I have the windshield in a high position, although you can move it down lower as well. I just found it had more protection in a high position, but overall I think the windshield is pretty nice. Let's move around to the side of the bike. So you notice the bike does not come with handguards of any kind, which is kind of an interesting omission, um, but that's okay. You can put on handguards if you'd like to 
protect from the wind or protect from falling down on the trail. The mirrors work really well. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, around here, these side plastic fairings, I think these are going to be pretty vulnerable in case of a tip over or an accident. So if you're going to be using the bike a lot on the trail, you might want to invest in some engine crash bars. The engine does stick out quite a bit here. So I don't know, I think in really severe usage, you could potentially damage this if you fall over a lot. Um, but you know, something to keep in mind. Um, you've got small uh, foot pegs. The rubber does not seem to be removable on these and you've got these foot peg feelers here. These would be a good upgrade if you're going to go off road. You've got your brake lever here. Uh, you've got this kind of trellis looking rear frame. Removable passenger pegs, I think that's a nice touch that they're removable. You've got this large exhaust shield here behind the foot peg and what I really found was that when I was standing up off-road my boot would contact this exhaust shield and it made it very awkward to stand up on this bike so that's something to keep in mind. Talking about the seat of the bike, I found the seat to be very, very comfortable, even on something like a 300 mile long day. And we talked about that just over 32 and a half inch seat height, which makes it very approachable for newer riders or just for shorter riders. Let's move around towards the back of the bike so you can see the LED turn signals. You've also got an LED uh, brake taillight, which I think is nice. You've got the license plate holder here. You've got grab panels, which is a great thing, although there's no rear cargo rack, but I'm sure that's something you can find pretty easily in the aftermarket. Also, I want to point out this twin outlet exhaust, which actually looks pretty nice, but it doesn't have too much sound to it. Like I, I'm going to mention later in the view, the experience of riding the bike, it kind of sounds like riding a vacuum cleaner, which is unfortunate because I think with a better exhaust, this bike would actually sound pretty good. Let's take a look at the cockpit of the bike, the handlebars, controls, dashboard. Um, so you do have adjustable preload on the forks, which is nice, although that's the only adjustment that you have there. Um, you have pretty standard grips, you have pretty standard switch gear, nice big buttons. Some people on these Hondas, they'll kind of confuse the horn and the turn signals. So a lot of times when you're trying to change lanes, you end up honking the horn, but you get used to it. I like how all the buttons are oversized, easy to use with gloves, high low beam switch here. Otherwise, the key's in a position where you would expect it. We already talked about the adjustable windshield. One touch that I do really like is to give you this accessory bar here, which would be an awesome place to mount a GPS or a cell phone if you wanted to go that way. The dashboard is just okay in my opinion. Like it's a bit small, so it's an LCD, not a TFT. The tachometer is very small. Um, the speedometer is big enough and then all the other readouts are pretty comprehensive, better than something like the KLR I recently reviewed. So you get things like a fuel gauge, you get um, dual trip meters, you get a temperature gauge, you get uh, miles per gallon readout, um, you get a gear position indicator, which is a nice thing. So pretty full featured there. And then you've got um, a couple buttons here to control things. Um, but that's about it here for the front. Uh, the handlebars are comfortable, nice bend, put you in a good position for sitting or standing. So yeah, really no complaints or no surprises here. The brake lever is adjustable, but the clutch lever is not adjustable. So for those of you who are going to use this bike on the trail, there's something to keep in mind here. Uh, the bike does not have a whole lot of ground clearance. I'll list the actual measurement here, um, but it's pretty low for an adventure bike. That's one of the compromises you get with having a nice low seat height. Um, the exhaust headers are pretty vulnerable. And then the underside of the engine is fairly vulnerable and the exhaust runs under here as well. So for off-roading, you're gonna definitely wanna consider investing in a skid plate. Um, in terms of doing maintenance on this bike, people always want me to talk about the maintenance. The oil change is gonna be very simple with a drain plug down here and a spin-on automotive type oil filter. Okay, let's see how the little CB500X does on some sandy desert two-track out here in Anzabrego Desert State Park. Nothing too crazy, but kind of want to see how it handles in this more of this desert environment here, because this is a kind of terrain that a lot of adventure riders would ride in. Okay. So kind of the whole theme of this review on the CB is just kind of how easy it is to ride and it's not too intimidating. Now it doesn't mean it's perfect. I mean, it's not set up to race through the desert and it, the handling can be sometimes a little bit, um, a little bit twitchy like in the sand, but it's not that bad. Like here, I'll show you, I'll cross the sandy median. Like you can see it wants to grab the bars a bit. But that's going to happen on pretty much any adventure bike. 
But actually, considering I've got these stock tires, which are kind of like a 70-30 tire, biased towards the street, it's really not too bad. And again, because the bike is relatively low to the ground and relatively lightweight for a multi-cylinder adventure bike, it's really not intimidating to ride. Like, I'm not scared of taking it up here. I'm not really scared of getting stuck in the sand. If I did get stuck, I could pull it out because it's not too heavy. Um, it's just a wonderful bike to come out and explore on and just see the scenery and have kind of a just an easygoing adventure. I think that's really what the CP is about. But I'm surprised. It actually feels really good on this kind of stuff. You know, I'll show this in other parts of this review, but when this bike starts to kind of get out of its league is when the terrain gets really rough and rocky and, you know, because the suspension just doesn't have a whole lot of travel there to work with, right? But that's also what gives you the, the nice low seat height and the nice, you know, just how low and compact this whole bike is, which makes it good for beginners, but also for more experienced riders too. I mean, there's 45 miles an hour and it feels great. I mean, again, just don't go off any jumps or hit anything too bad and it, it works just fine. This is a dead end maybe, yeah. See, like in ruts and stuff, yeah, I mean, you, you know, you use up the suspension pretty easily, but like, look, trying to turn it around here, it doesn't feel so big and bulky and cumbersome as the larger adventure bikes do and what that means is that i think you're more whoa <laughs> the back end came up there um it means you're more likely i think to go explore the trails because you're just not as you know it, it, it's not as scary as as maneuvering a 500 or 600 pound bike you know Ugh. See, the, the suspension reaches its limits pretty fast, but, you know, I can accept that for the price that this bike is. Um, and I'm actually really impressed how well it's handling. It just doesn't feel top-heavy, you know? It doesn't feel top-heavy. It, it just doesn't feel too big. Like, if you know how to ride, if you've ridden other adventure bikes or other dual sport bikes, like, you're gonna get on this thing and have a blast. It's it's really very easy to ride. And the power is so linear, it never surprises you. It never really does anything that's like, oh no, you know, I'm gonna lose control. Um, even these ABS brakes, I mean, that's all the way into the brakes there. It stops pretty well. But man, I, I kind of think that this bike has so much unrealized potential, right? I mean, if it had knobby tires and maybe just a little bit better suspension, a little more travel without making it too tall um, and some off-road armor, I mean, there's, I would take this, I would take this anywhere that I would take the Tenere 700 or 790 or GS. And it's actually a little bit easier to ride than any of those bikes. Although it doesn't have, you know, the performance envelope that those do. I don't think that's a problem for the average person. Like, I just don't. I mean, yeah, it wants to knife into the sand a bit, but, you know, not as much as that Tiger 900 that I've been riding. And then when you get back here on the road, I mean, you know, cruising at 60, 65, 70 is smooth, comfortable, and you get, you know, 60, 65 miles a gallon doing it. I mean, there's really just not a lot to complain about with this bike.
Okay, full throttle acceleration on the CB. So let me show you that we're kind of going uphill and it's kind of windy out here. I'm in sixth gear at 60 miles an hour. There's just not much, see there's not, that's full throttle. There's not much roll on power uh, with the CB. But what you can do is downshift and spin the engine up because you know, this, this engine doesn't have a lot of low down power. So if you're willing to run it in fourth gear, see now I can pull away. 70 there we go so see it's really not too bad okay rolling start okay, let me show you the braking from uh, 70 miles an hour yeah see that's a lot better than a KLR 650 or a Royal Enfield Himalayan so in terms of safety and sort of how fast you can stop and how confident the handling is, I think this bike is extremely good for the money. So I'm driving along here at 60, 65 miles an hour. It's very windy out here. I don't know if you can hear that, uh, but it's like 25, 30 mile per hour uh, wind coming from this direction. And this wind protection is pretty good. Like the fairing is not that wide in this area, but the windshield works very well. It's got these ducts in it. And it works even better because I've got this visor, this clip-on visor, which I use all the time. Um, but with this combination and the windshield in a higher position, I mean, this thing, it's its not a gold wing, but it's very competitive with other full-size adventure bikes for wind protection. Like you could, I can go with my visor up like, like that, uh, visor up 60, 65 miles an hour, and it's fine. I mean, you need to protect your eyes, but... But yeah, the wind protection is very impressive for this little machine. It's it's really, uh, you could tour all day on this, day after day, and not have any issues with, with comfort. Okay, this is a real fun twisty road. Love this road. We'll get after it a little bit here. Uh, nothing dangerous, but we'll we'll push the bike a little bit and see. The fun thing about the 500 is that because you only have you know around 50 horsepower, so even for like more beginner or intermediate riders, you can use most of the power. And I'll show you what I mean. It's not uh, super scary. You know, you can use full drive coming out of the corners most of the time. It has really good, really good cornering clearance. See, here's what I mean about full power. This is full power right here. And it's not like I'm going 120 miles an hour and gonna kill myself. You still can kill yourself, trust me. But for people that are newer to riding or even people with a lot of experience, it's just, it's fun because you can really twist the throttle all the way and it's very engaging to ride because of that. Whoop. One too many gears there. This is such a fun little road. Come on, push it. See, I only get up to 70 there and I'm wringing its neck, you know. And that's why these bikes make so much sense in the real world. I think if you, I think if this was ridden really well and I'm not a good enough rider to fully ride it to its full potential, but I think if you were an extremely good rider, you could embarrass some much more powerful bikes with this little machine, especially on like a tight twisty road, especially with the right tires on it. Come on, 
come on, come on. Push it, push it, push it. Push it, push it, push it, come on. Come on, you're almost there. Come on. Ah. Lifting was pretty easy, although it's awkward to do with this Instacam mounted to my body, so I'm not going to do that next time. But I would give the bike like maybe uh, B minus, C plus in terms of the lifting scale, so not bad. So the most common bikes that people are going to want to compare the CB500X to are things like Kawasaki's KLR 650, the Royal Enfield Himalayan, the Suzuki V-Strom 650, Kawasaki Versus X300, the Kawasaki Versus 650, the KTM 390 Adventure, and of course Honda's own NC750X, or previously the NC700. Now that's a long list of bikes to compare to, so we can't really go in depth, but let's just cover each one of these briefly. So let's talk about um, one of the direct competition and a bike that I've tested recently, Kawasaki's new for 2022 updated KLR650. So this bike costs about the same as a KLR, depending on what package you get on the KLR. But if you get a base KLR with ABS, it comes in right at the exact same price this does, which I think is very, very interesting. With the KLR650, here's what the difference is. The KLR has a longer travel suspension, and when you ride off-road, it's much more plush, it's much more able to absorb impacts from rocks and trail debris, and it just gives you a much smoother, more controlled ride. And I would say you could ride about 30 or 40% faster on the KLR, just because this has such a short travel bouncy suspension that can make things get out of control pretty fast. The KLR uses a 21 inch front wheel as compared to the 19 inch front wheel on this bike, but the KLR is taller, it's appreciably heavier, it's got a single cylinder engine which has much more vibration and feels much more old fashioned than the twin cylinder engine on this bike. And overall I think the KLR might be a little bit more roomy for the rider and the passenger, it might be a little bit better at carrying gear, it's just a little bit more of a pack mule, um, but overall this is a very very strong competitor to the KLR. What about KTM's 390 Adventure? Unfortunately, I haven't been able to test that bike yet, although I have ridden the 390 and I found it pretty entertaining, but it was a 390 Duke, not the 390 Adventure. So with the KTM, here's what you're getting. You're getting similar wheel sizes to this and you're still getting the cast wheels. You're getting a slightly smaller engine, although it still makes pretty good power, but it's gonna have less torque than this bike. The suspension on the KTM is a little bit more off-road oriented, so you have a bit more travel and a bit better damping than this bike, based on what other riders have been saying. But also the bike is a bit taller, so the seat height's a little bit taller. You get electronics with that bike, you get the TFT dash, and you get um, better uh, customization with things like your ABS and your traction control, so it has more tech. So I think the KTM is a really good competitor, but some people will be more brand loyal to the Honda, some people will be more brand loyal to the KTM. It's just gonna depend on your preferences. Okay, so the Royal Enfield Himalayan. A lot of people are talking about that bike and I'm trying to get the 2022 model for testing. I'm even thinking about maybe buying one because I actually really like that bike a lot. Here's the differences there. So the, the Royal Enfield uses a slightly smaller engine, but again, it's using a single cylinder engine, not a twin cylinder engine, so it's not as smooth. Um, you're talking about 24 horsepower on that Royal Enfield versus over 45 horsepower on this Honda. So that's quite a big difference there. This is a faster bike and a much smoother engine. However, the Royal Enfield is a bit more rugged. It uses the larger 21 inch front wheel, it uses spoked wheels, it has longer suspension travel that's actually fairly well damped for its price point. And overall, it's just a bit more off-road oriented bike. It also has a lower seat height by about an inch, one or two inches lower than this. So that's, that's substantial for some people. So what about the Suzuki V-Strom 650? You should go watch my V-Strom 650 review if you haven't already because I really thoroughly tested that bike. Uh, this to me feels like just a scaled down version of the V-Strom. So if that's something that you, sounds good to you, then you're gonna wanna try this bike. This bike is easier to ride, it's less intimidating, it's shorter, it's lighter. Off-road, it doesn't feel quite as scary. It just feels a bit more stable and predictable and you notice quite a bit the less weight and just how much less tall it is. Um, on the highway, the V-Strom is better. It has quite a bit more power. It's a larger engine, and it's gonna be better for touring and carrying luggage and passengers than this bike would. 
What about the Kawasaki versus X300? It's not a very popular bike and I haven't been able to test one yet, although I will try to get one. Um, it uses a smaller engine, but otherwise it's, it's a little bit lighter than this bike, but the other specs are similar. If you look at the suspension travel, the ground clearance, the wheel sizes, it's actually pretty similar, even the seat height compared to the CB500. I think it's just a slightly scaled down version of this in terms of the engine. Um, so it's something you wanna look at, but the engine you're gonna have to work it harder and rev it more um, to get down the road. And I don't think it'll be as good for highway riding as this bike will with this larger engine. What about Kawasaki Versus 650? So the Versus is a street-oriented bike. It uses 17-inch wheels. It's got that um, under the engine exhaust, which is very vulnerable, and it's hard to put a skid plate under there. It's just not very a very rugged bike. Um, it's a 650 engine, so it's larger, it's more powerful, it's better on the highway, it has sportier handling. It's a really, really great road bike, and if Zach Quartz is listening, he's gonna jump in here and say how amazing the Versus 650 is. Uh, but yeah, the Versus is a great bike, but this is a bit more of an all-rounder. This is also a smaller, lighter, and lower bike. What about Honda's own NC750X? Well, uh, more recently, Honda has taken that bike, which used to be the 700, and they made it more of a street bike. They've reduced the suspension travel, and they put it more in the category of like an urban bike, a commuter bike. Um, it has a nice low seat height. It's got that really low stress torquey engine, which is a larger engine than this with more power and torque, but it's still pretty mild. It's got that amazing underseat storage, which is kind of a game changer feature of that bike, which this bike doesn't have. But overall, that's gonna be something for uh, urban use, for highway use, Use, whereas this is going to be more of an all-around adventure bike. Final thoughts on Honda's CB500X. Let me start by telling you a little story about this bike. So a few days after I picked up this bike from Honda, I decided to take like a morning ride. I was thinking maybe just a couple hours, do a little bit of filming and come home and enjoy the rest of the day with my family. Well, this bike ended up being so much fun, so capable and so extremely comfortable that I ended up riding, doing an eight hour ride and riding over 300 miles on this bike on that day, which I never planned to do. Never once during that ride did I say to myself, I really need more power or I need more technology or I need more capability or I need more comfort. This bike does everything that I really need to do on a daily basis and even in light adventure riding. And you can add to that the fact that I achieved over 60 miles a gallon on that ride with this bike, and I was running this bike hard. I mean, I won't mention the speeds I was going, but I was really testing it to see how fast I could go, and I was not going easy on the bike. And the fact that I got over 60 miles a gallon is a pretty amazing achievement and gives this bike a huge riding range. This little bike punches way above its weight class, and it delivers a truly capable all-around package that is gonna make both beginner and experienced riders happy. Now this bike is not perfect. There's no switch to turn off the ABS. The engine sounds kind of like an angry vacuum cleaner. It's very uninspiring. It's a little out of breath above 75 miles an hour. And off-road, it is pretty limited by its really short travel bouncy suspension that makes controlling the bike at higher speeds pretty difficult. This motorcycle makes me really reflect on myself and question my own personal need for larger, heavier, more expensive adventure bikes with a lot more to go wrong and a lot more weight to deal with and a much taller bike that you're always tipping over because you can't reach the ground in difficult situations. This thing really makes me question sort of the wisdom of do we really need these huge, fancy, expensive adventure bikes? I think in some ways on, on a lot of rides that you might do, you might actually have more fun on a small, somewhat underpowered, under suspended bike like this because you're able to use more of its capability and that makes it engaging. And also it's just not intimidating. It's fun, it's charismatic, and it's easy to ride. So whether you're a beginner rider looking to get into adventure riding, maybe you're looking for a commuter bike, you want something that's easy to ride low to the ground, or even if you're a more experienced rider who's just kind of sick of the heavy, tall, expensive, technology-laden adventure bikes, Either way, either camp you fall in, this bike should be very, very high on your list. And if you wanna make it into more of an off-road capable adventure bike, the aftermarket with companies like Rally Raid, they really have you covered to set this bike up for some pretty amazing capability. So just like I did in the Tiger 900 review, I'm gonna do a follow-up video answering your questions about the bike. So whatever I didn't cover, whatever comments and questions you have, please put them down below, and I'll make a list of all the most useful questions, and we'll cover those in a follow-up video. But otherwise, I just wanna thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your support as this channel grows. It really means a lot to me. Um, you can help me out by subscribing, hitting the bell, leaving a comment. You can support me on Patreon, you can buy my merchandise, and you can also shop at Rocky Mountain using the link below in the description and in all my other videos. And a small commission helps support the channel. 
Thanks again so much for watching. Ride safe and we'll see you in a few days.